welcome and I'm so glad that you have joined us for today's session on adapting the textbook for communicative teaching. Um, if you've been waiting, you might have noticed that there have been some invitations to some events that are happening online. Uh, and so please do sign up for the Facebook group, the webinar series, Let's Speak English, and also complete our survey in order to enter the raffle. This is to learn more about English teaching in Japan. And so please complete that um, as soon as possible to be part of the raffle drawing for some prizes. So before we get started, we're going to go ahead and listen to a uh, short introduction from Grace, who is here at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. 本日はご参加いただき、誠にありがとうございます。Hello, everyone. My name is Grace Choi, and I'm an American diplomat working on education and exchanges at the United States Embassy in Tokyo. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar for English teachers, organized by Tokyo English Language Fellow Claire Lee in coordination with the U.S. Embassy. As you know, English is a language that allows us to communicate with people all around the world. Through these webinars, we hope you will learn about the benefits of communicative English teaching and how to implement it in your school and classroom. Because of your efforts, Japanese students will be able to interact with youth in other countries and become performers on a global stage. As a fellow educator, I know how important it is for teachers to update and improve their teaching methods, and I hope this webinar will provide you with that opportunity. Claire Sensei is an expert on this subject, and I'm sure you will benefit from her advice and guidance. Thank you for your dedication to teaching and to your students, and please enjoy the session. Thank you, and see you soon. All right, thank you to Grace Choi for those words. And we'll go ahead and get started for today on adapting the textbook for communicative language teaching. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, even though uh, we are, you may be very busy, I really appreciate the time you took to join us for today's webinar. In the chat box, I would please like for you to share where you live, the age group that you teach, and why you decided to join this workshop. So for example, I would share, I am from uh, Los Angeles, but I am currently living in Tokyo, Japan. Right now, I am working primarily with teachers and teacher training, so adults. And why I wanted to join this workshop, I felt it was very important uh, specifically to think about textbooks and how to adapt the textbooks. So as I've talked to many different Japanese teachers of English uh, since being here, one of the primary complaints is the difficulty of how much work there is in the textbook and considering how to actually add some communicative language teaching uh, when the textbook does not follow that model. So let's see um, any responses in the chat box. Okay, welcome Hiji-san. Um, you're from Tokyo in Kawasaki City. Very nice, welcome, thank you for joining. We also have Megan from the US Embassy joining us. She lives in uh, Gunma and is working at the Embassy in Tokyo. And she works with me closely on the English language programs for Japanese teachers. Thank you so much for joining us today, Megan. So I'm going to give everyone one uh, more minute to go ahead and share in the chat box. I would love to hear more about where you're from, the age group that you teach, and why you've decided to join this workshop. Welcome Natsuka-san in Fukuoka, wonderful. Fourth graders in elementary school, awesome. Great, in Okinawa, welcome. 
junior high school. Great, thank you for sharing. Yeah, so it seems like there's a lot of interest in specifically thinking about young learners uh, with teaching English. Thank you for sharing. Hello, Mika-san. High school students, awesome, thank you. Welcome to the workshop. All right. Oh, in Hokkaido, very nice. Numata-san. Wow, we have people from all over Japan, all the way from Hokkaido, all the way to Okinawa. It's wonderful to have so many of you join us here this evening. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Well, let's go ahead. Uh, first, I just wanted to mention that this webinar is being recorded. So uh, please note that um, and thank you for your participation. So some norms for today's workshop. Uh, please have your mic muted so that there isn't background noise. However, I would like for you to participate in the chat. It's really important for me to hear from you as teachers. You are the experts of your classes. And so hearing more from you is going to be very important. So I'd love to hear about things like where you're teaching, what age group, some of the difficulties that you face, um, and so on. And finally, please share the air. Um, so there may be points where not in today's webinar, but in future webinars where you will be asked to share. And uh, please just make sure that everyone has a chance to participate. So just a little bit about me. My name is Claire and I am an English language fellow placed at the US Embassy in Tokyo. So I have 10 years of teaching and training experience uh, all around the world. I started off as an English teacher in the United States. Uh, and then I've also taught in South Africa, Vietnam and the Philippines. So today we have a couple of objectives. The first is to identify, is the activity we are doing a communicative language activity? So if you attended last week's webinar, we talked about what is communicative language teaching, and this is an extension of that. There are five questions that you can ask to find out is the task you are trying to have students do actually communicative? Next is to outline the steps for adapting a textbook activity. So many of you have textbooks where um, whether it's communicative or not, it might not be the most interesting. So there are many, many reasons to adapt the textbook, uh, but one of them is to make it more communicative. And so these, we're going to go through how do we actually do that with a textbook activity. And finally, uh, we will have a chance to discuss how we might want to adapt a sample lesson. So we'll just review the communicative language teaching principles from the last webinar. If you haven't had a chance uh, to be in that webinar, that will be posted on the U.S. Embassy Tokyo uh, YouTube channel. We'll also talk about how do we know if a textbook activity is communicative. We'll then go through the steps to adapt an activity and look at the different types of activities that are communicative. Then we'll put it into practice by looking at an actual textbook uh, that is used here in Japan. So let's first think about this question. And there are many different answers. Why would you adapt a textbook? And by adapt, I mean, instead of simply teaching exactly what's on the page, we might change it slightly. We might add an outside reading in addition to the textbook. We might say, we don't want to do this chapter or these pages for some reason. We might change the order. So we might do something first um, and second and switch it. 
we might also want to add a whole new section in. We might take the activity they have and change it to fit our students. So please add in the chat box, what are some reasons why you would adapt something from the textbook that you teach? I'll just give everyone a minute to share in the chat box. One answer that I have for this is that one time I was teaching a textbook that was too high level for my students. And so when I was teaching it to them, I needed to change it because the actual reading and concepts were too high. Uh, and my students were not at that level. And so I need to simplify it a little bit more. So that is one reason you might adapt a textbook is because it does not match the level of your students. So I'll give everyone a minute. Please share in the chat box. Why would you adapt something from the textbook? And remember, adapting doesn't just mean to change it. It could be changing the order, taking things out, adding some supplementary materials, taking out an entire unit. All right, so let's see the answers that we have coming in. Okay, so one point is that the textbook is based on the national curriculum. That's a really good point. So that's something that's important, right? So the national curriculum is for all of Japan, but it may not always fit our specific classroom and our students. So while there is a curriculum that students need to follow, some things may not be suitable for them. Yeah. So we have a curriculum in each school and grade, yes. So maybe the textbook chosen does not always match what the school or grade level is asking for. Great. What are some other reasons why we might change the activities in a textbook? The students cannot relate to the content. Very nice. So that's a great example. For example, if the textbook is a little old, it might talk about sending emails to friends. But students these days will send a text message instead. Absolutely. So nowadays, if we're talking about sending emails, students sending emails, they're not sending emails, right? So it can be a little bit of out of date or the content may not fit for our students. Yes, so matching the student's level using textbooks in each school, absolutely. Great, excellent ideas and points, everyone. Thank you for sharing. All right, so let's review. Um, Oh, one more point for the last, uh, for this question. Too little information because of the page limit. Excellent. So maybe there's not enough information. We actually have to add in more information so our students understand. So these are some of the communicative language teaching principles that were discussed last session, uh, last webinar, when introducing communicative language teaching. So these are things uh, that are part of what um, is important to CLT. First, learners should speak English for real communication. So real communication, what does this mean? This means that they are actually trying to share or receive some sort of information for a, a real purpose. 
right? They're not just repeating something from the textbook, um, something, uh, I think someone mentioned, you know, sending emails to friends. That's not really real communication because they wouldn't be sending email to friends, right? Um, so that's very important for real communication. The second principle is that um, communicative language teaching encourages students to experiment with the language and make mistakes. So if the activity is one that does not allow for mistakes or really has very little room for mistakes, then um, it's important to reconsider how do we make sure that this is an activity that allows for practice, not perfect. Of course, we should try to aim for correct use of vocabulary and grammar, um, but if there's zero room for that, it can be very difficult for students. Students should also interact with each other and be encouraged to speak. So interacting with each other, that means they're not just on their own doing their own uh, worksheets or textbook work, um, but they are able to interact, able to talk and listen to partners or in small groups. But it's not just speaking and listening, it could also be reading and writing as well. So maybe the students are reading each other's writing um, and communicating that way. And finally, activities should be meaningful and involve real conversation. So meaningful, this means something that they feel like they would actually, that has a purpose, right? And that they would actually be doing in real life. So it should be something uh, where uh, there is some end goal. So how do we know if a textbook activity is communicative? and follows those principles. There are five questions that you can ask. First is, does it engage students' interests? Now, of course, not every activity and every uh, reading or topic is going to be interesting to every student. But generally, does it interest the students? If students are reading about, for example, um, something that bores them or they cannot relate to, uh, perhaps it's not the proper topic for them. For example, in a textbook, I once saw an activity where students were acting as the manager of a company and also uh, an employee. Now, these were middle school students. Middle school students probably do not relate to being a manager and company employee. That might be more suited for students who are learning business English uh, or students who are looking to get jobs. However, for middle school students, it probably was not the most interesting and exciting topic. The second question to ask is, does it encourage student interaction? So if this activity requires that students are speaking or writing, uh, but in a way where they are able to share ideas with their peers, that encourages interaction. So an activity, for example, where students are simply writing an essay and that's it, no one reads their essay except for you as the teacher, that doesn't encourage interaction. However, if students are writing letters to each other, are exchanging those letters, they have to read it and they have to write a response, that's something that would be more interactive. The third question, you should ask about the textbook activity is, does it relate to the real world? So as I mentioned before, even though there was the activity with the manager and the employee, yes, that's something that relates to the real world, but perhaps doesn't relate to students' lives, right? Another example 
could be some uh, dialogue that are in textbooks where, uh, where two people in the textbook are talking and they're talking about, for example, their favorite music genres. So it's important to consider, is this something that would naturally happen if students were talking with each other? Now, a lot of students really like music and are interested in different uh, musicians and artists. And so it might be a topic that relates to the real world. However, if the textbook has, you know, musicians or artists that are really old or that students don't know, it might not be something that is as relevant for them. So you could change that activity to make it more relevant by asking students, what are their favorite musicians and bands? The fourth question to ask is, does this lead to students speaking or writing creatively? Now, this is very important. What do I mean by creatively? This doesn't necessarily mean creative writing where students are um, writing stories, fantasy stories, or, or things like this. By creatively, it means that they are able to use new and novel sentences and formations. So they're not just simply repeating what has been given to them, but they're trying to formulate some new sentences out of what they have learned in order to express themselves. Finally, does it focus on meaning? Now, if you remember from last week, one of the myths was that communicative language teaching does not focus on grammar, which is untrue. Grammar is still very important to communicate. If we don't have proper grammar, then the listener uh, is going to be confused about what we mean. But if we only focus on form, on the grammar, then it can become a meaningless activity for our students. Our students need to see that what we're doing has some meaning, right? So does it focus on meaning, not just the form? So we're not just doing grammar drills or memorization exercises. We're using that and then using the vocabulary or grammar in a useful way, in a real life situation. So those were five questions to ask yourself about, uh, let's say you open up a textbook and you're looking at an activity or a lesson. So if the answer to those are no, it's possible that the textbook is not very communicative or that lesson is not very communicative. So instead, we may need to adapt or change that lesson or activity in the textbook. So how do we actually do that? We can break this down into steps. The first is to identify what is the objective of that lesson or task and what are students given to complete it? So in looking through um, a lot of the Japanese uh, foreign language textbooks of English, um, I noticed that the lesson pages will often say at the top goal, and then it'll say what, uh, what students are supposed to be able to do. So for example, uh, it has goal, students are able to use the past tense, right? So we can identify by the end of this lesson, what should students do? So we look at that textbook page and we see, okay, this is what they need to do. Now, if that isn't in the textbook uh, where you're teaching, you should kind of look through the activity and see by the end, what are students able to do? And what are students given? What, are they given some vocabulary? Are there some grammar points that they are given? Is there a reading or a listening they have to do? 
are there pictures that they can look at that is related to the lesson? Are there activities where they have to do some writing? Or are there sections that give them instructions for speaking, whether as a presentation or uh, in small groups as discussion? So we need to first identify the objective and the things that students are given. The second step is to think about when would you use this in a real life context? So we'll go back to the example of using the past tense. So let's say it's simple past tense. When would we use the simple past tense? Can think of some examples, maybe what we did this weekend, right? So in real life, how would we use this in a way to communicate? is I am talking to my friend and asking my friend or my coworker, oh, what did you do this weekend, right? And then you would need to use simple past tense to say, well, uh, I slept in because I was very tired or I decided to go to the park or I went to see a movie right? or I went shopping. Whatever it is that you, uh, you did, that's how you would use the past tense, right? So a real life context might be speaking to someone else about their weekend, the past weekend. Now, there are many real life contexts that you can use the simple past tense. Um, and you can think of one that would be appropriate for the level of your students and the age group. Right, so something like speaking about the weekend might be appropriate for middle school, maybe upper elementary school, uh, maybe for high school, it would be more complex, right? Um, so we would consider different things uh, for what we might, what the context might be. Now, the third step is to think about what is the language that they need to carry out this communication. So thinking about the textbook activity, it might be something related to the textbook, uh, the content of the textbook, or it might be something different. Now, it, it's a lot of work to go out and find whole new resources and readings and topics um, for the textbook. So sometimes having a topic very similar to the one in the textbook is okay. So you would identify what is the language that is needed. Well, we would need to learn the different uh, past tense verbs, right, in English, how to conjugate those past, uh, the verbs into simple past tense. We would also need to know how to formulate a question. What did you do this weekend? We would also need to know how to answer that, where we would have I, so the subject, the verb, and then the object, right? Um, so we might identify that. Um, and then we're going to choose an activity that would accomplish that goal using the real life situation. So in part two, the second step was to think about the real life context, the real life situation. Let's try to create an activity. So, as I mentioned, past tense, simple past tense, asking about the weekend, they'll need to know the question, the answer structure, maybe the past tense verbs. And an activity that they can do is that they have a um, bingo form, right? A bingo form. So if I don't know if you guys are familiar with bingo, but bingo has a, a board. And in each section, they have to write different things. And they have to, uh, let's say each of these has a different uh, activity. So one box says, go to the movie or went to the movies. One box says slept in. One box says, uh, you know, 
went to the park, whatever it is. Um, and they have to go around to their classmates and ask, what did you do this weekend? And then their partner says, well, I slept in. Oh, great. Then they'll go ahead, write the name of the student in the box, and then they try to get three in a row, ding, 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 or four in a row. So there is some sort of purpose to this activity and they're able to communicate with each other. So those are four steps for adapting an activity to make it communicative. Let's talk about, in this last step, we talked about select a communicative activity. Okay, but what are some communicative activities that we can use? We can categorize activities um, and there are many different kinds of communicative activities. The first is task completion. So this is like the bingo where they have to finish the task for some reason, they have to try to get three in a row, right? So these include things like puzzles, games, map reading. So anything where they have some sort of goal at the end uh, that they're trying to accomplish, um, whether that's winning or getting three in a row, finishing the puzzle, um, finding the place on the map. Another type of communicative activity is known as information gathering. So this is when students are going around and trying to get information from their peers from the other students. So these can be things like student conducted surveys. Students are going around and asking each other different questions for their survey. For example, what is your favorite snack? And they have to collect and find out all the information from other students. This can also be interviews. So for example, students have a partner and they interview each other about a topic. So I might ask questions like, tell me about where you live. What is your home like? Uh, how many rooms is in your home? Things like that. And searches. So this might be not that they're necessarily uh, going and asking to other students, but there's information either around the classroom or maybe online on a website where students are working together to find that information. So maybe the informa information is not from the other students, but from an outside source. A third type of communicative activity is known as opinion sharing activities. And it's just like what it sounds. It's where students are sharing how they feel about something, whether they like or dislike, whether they agree or disagree. So students compare values, opinions, or beliefs. So for example, students might go around and share about which movie how they felt about a certain movie. How did you like the Avengers movie? How did you like the new movie? I, I don't really watch movies, so I don't know what's that, but you know, uh, different movies that they have watched. Another type of communicative an, uh, activity is information transfer. So this is to try and share information with one another in order to do something. For example, reading instructions on how to get from A to B. So figuring out how do we get from school to the library? And then they have to draw a map. So that's an example of an information transfer activity. It's not just gathering the information, it's gathering it and then creating something from it. So maybe they gather information like this um, for directions 
and then they have to draw a map. Another one could be gathering information about how to cook a certain dish, right? So for example, how do you make takoyaki? They have to come up with uh, and research about the ingredients, how do you make it? And then they have to create a recipe book that they're going to put together. Each student or each pair of students has one recipe that they write and then it makes a book. Finally, uh, we have role plays. So this uh, includes activities in which students are given roles and improvise a scene. So they are going to act in certain positions. So for example, uh, you know, this was the one previously, uh, but the manager and the employee that would work for, for example, a university level class, uh, but there might be other role plays that are appropriate for students. So things like in elementary school, uh, role playing, going to the library and checking out a book or role playing, getting directions to go to uh, take a certain subway station, role playing, you know, asking uh, a friend to share some food. So those are some examples. Remember, you want to make it as relevant to students' lives as possible to make it a stronger communicative activity. Now, thinking about these different types of activities, let's look at this textbook, New Horizon English Course 3. So this is a textbook that is used here in Japan. Uh, and I chose a unit called a speech about my brother. Now, I know this is a little hard to see because the text is very small, but let's first look through this textbook page or, or these three textbook pages in order to see what is happening in this textbook. So first we see here at the top, we have the goal. Remember, this is the first step that we want to do is to consider what is the goal of this text, uh, of this lesson. We then see this warm up, this starting out warm up okay, with some information about different people. And you see these pictures, this girl, and she's clearly talking about someone else, Sam, right, and what, what they often do, what he's good at. We see here, there's also a listening and some vocabulary here as well. With the listening, there are some tasks. And then we have these pages. We see there is this big drawing. And we have this drawing with this girl who says, this is Pakuya, my brother. He lives in the Philippines. Does he like scuba diving? Yes, he does. And here is a picture of her, we can assume is her brother. Here's a little reading about the Philippines, right? We see a picture of the Philippines uh, on the map, the flag and some information with a picture as well. And then we have this reading, this story about a speech about my brother, which includes two paragraphs. Here's some vocabulary, some more drawings, which are supposed to be pictures of uh, her brother. Um, and then we have some grammar, some key sentences here. So this is one of the textbooks, I believe this is the junior high school, a junior high school level textbook. So these were the four steps to adapting a lesson. The first was to consider what is the goal? What is the objective? And it told us here, right at the top, that the goal is to ask and tell about people and things other than yourself. So this is third person, right? You are using third person um, and to share about someone else. 
Now we want to think about when would we use this in a real life situation, right? So one is meeting someone new, right, who's trying to get to know your family or friends. So maybe you're talking about your family or friends. Maybe you're talking about someone who's not there. You could also use it for gossiping, right? So you use third person to gossip about someone else so-and-so did this, blah, 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 right? So there are many situations sorry, where you would um, tell about someone other than yourself. Right? Now, what is the language that you need? There's a couple of different things, right? So we need to know the different third person uh, present tense. Uh, we also need to note gerunds. Here, we're specifically talking about, and we can see it here, he is good at blank, skiing, diving, reading, uh, etc. So we know this is some of the language that, that we need. Now, let's look at different activities that will fulfill this. And we're going to show an example of each of these five different types of communicative activities. Now, these are not all going to be the best activities, and that's okay because the point is to show you that there are different kinds and some activity types may fit better than others for the lesson that you are teaching. So let's look at this first activity, which is to create a title. So for each paragraph, um, students must consider an appropriate title. You can either create your own and have students match them. So you as a teacher have a couple of different titles, one for each paragraph, and they must match. And they need to discuss why. Or you can also have students write their own titles, right? So here, uh, here are two of the paragraphs from the reading. Actually, this reading has more paragraphs, but for now, we're just going to look at the two paragraphs for this. Okay. So I'm going to demonstrate this activity with Megan. So Megan, let's go ahead and we're going to act as if we are the students. Okay, let's come up with some titles for these. So the first paragraph, what do you think? The first paragraph is about Megan. Called My Brother Takuya. Yeah, that's a good one. My Brother Takuya. Yeah, because it talks about how old he is and he's in Cebu. Cebu. Okay, so my brother Takuya. What about this second paragraph? Takuya goes to school mm. days. Mm. Takuya in Cebu. Takuya in Cebu. Oh, yeah, because it talks about Cebu here. Yeah, it has many beautiful beaches. Okay, good. All right. So we could come up with some different titles, right? Takuya in Cebu, what he does in Cebu about my brother Takuya, whatever it is, right? It doesn't have to be the exact uh, same title. Uh, each student, uh, each pair may come up with different titles and that's okay right? Because we want them to be creative. So this is a task completion activity because there is some sort of goal at the end. Now let's look at these five questions to know if a textbook activity is communicative. 
The first question is, does it engage students' interests? Mm, I said maybe. Pro I, I'd say this reading in general is probably not the most interesting to students, right? This is a fictional character and they may or may not actually be interested. Probably no. We'll see. Right? Does it encourage student interaction? Well, I would say if students must work in pairs to write the titles, then yes. Now, you may have noticed, for example, that I did a lot more talking than Megan did. So it's important to consider as well, how do you make sure that students are equally talking enough? Third, does the activity relate to the real world? Again, mm, I said maybe, but probably not because Takuya is not a real person, right? And so this is not going to be as related to the real world. Does it lead to students speaking or writing creatively? Yes. So students' titles may all be different if they are writing their own titles together. And does it focus on meaning? I said yes, because the titles are based on something, some content. So it is meaningful in that way, right? Um, so it's not just about form and grammar in this case. We need to understand the meaning of the paragraph in order to create the titles. So I would say that would, that's an okay task. Maybe a different one would be better. So let's look at another one. Here we have a student survey. Notice that in the survey, at the top, we have these questions. Students will have a sheet like this, um, whether they fold it on their own or you print it out. Students will take that sheet and be able to interview and ask some questions to other students. Now, in a classroom where it's hard to move around, you can have students ask their neighbors around them, right? Or you can have the, what is known as concentric circles, the students that are facing each other and they move one, one, one like that. So they have different partners each time. So Megan and I are going to demonstrate this uh, as if we are going to interview one another. Well, Megan will interview me. Okay, Claire, do you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have a brother. Oh, and uh, where does your brother live? He lives in San Francisco. Okay, and how old is he now? He is 29 years old. Mm. Uh, and what are his hobbies? Um, he likes to skateboard. Oh, and uh, what does he do? Right now, he's a student, a graduate student. What is he studying? Can I ask? <laughs> yeah, he's studying psychology. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So then Megan would fill out this row with my information that I shared as I was speaking. And then she would go to another student and fill out the second row. Um, after this, I would also ask Megan and write down her answers on my paper. This is an information gathering activity right? because I am gathering information from my fellow students. Now, does it engage students' interests? Hopefully, yes, because they're talking about themselves. Does it encourage interaction? Yes, Megan and I were able to chat and share. Does it relate to the real world? Yes, because the questions are about real life. Does it lead to students speaking or writing creatively? I think in this case, yes. And does it focus on meaning? Yes, so this wasn't just a grammar exercise. This focused on uh, Megan understanding and getting answers from me and then writing them. 
Let's look at another activity here. This one is an opinion sharing activity. So you can have students in pairs and students will interview each other and have a few sentences and write a few sentences about where they would want to live and why. Afterwards, students can post their writing on uh, around the room or leave them at their desks and students can go around and read what everyone else has written. They can then vote on which one they agree with the most. So this is one thing that you could do with your students. So I am going to go ahead and demonstrate this with Megan. So uh, Megan, I will ask a few questions. So where would you want to live? Mm. To tell the truth, I want to live in Akasaka in Tokyo. Hmm. Whoa. That's cool. Why do you want to live there? Well, I work in Akasaka, so it would be close to my place of work. And also, Akasaka has many restaurants with delicious food. So I wish I could live here. Yeah. And uh, what's your favorite restaurant there? There is a Vietnamese restaurant here called Lotus Palace, and I like it. Okay, so imagine I were interviewing Megan and then I wrote this paragraph. Afterwards, we might go around and students would see which is the best place and why people vote on Megan's and some people say, yes, I agree. And some people say, mm, maybe not Akasaka, maybe somewhere else, right? So they can go around and also share how they feel. Okay, so this is one another activity that we could do. So does it engage students' interests? Hopefully, yes, because they're talking about themselves. Does it encourage interaction? Yes, Megan and I had a chance to uh, interview each other. Well, I interviewed her. Does this activity relate to the real world? Yes, because this is really what uh, about <laughs> what Megan where where Megan would like to live. Does it lead to students creatively speaking or writing? In this case, yes. So Megan had a chance to speak while I asked questions, but I also had to write down her answers and I could not write it down word for word, right? I couldn't say, I want to live in Akasaka because it's not me, right? It is Megan. So I needed to then change the sentences and make it uh, correct. Does it focus on meaning? Yes. So this isn't just a grammar exercise or a vocabulary exercise. There is some purpose to this. All right, two more activities. Uh, the next one is called information transfer activity. Dictate, uh, sorry, it is in the category of information transfer and it is to dictate a picture. So let's say you don't necessarily have the time or resources to be able to come up with a whole new reading, that's okay, right? Uh, we can still use what's in the textbook and change it to make it uh, more communicative. So with this activity in pairs, one student will describe, explain what the picture looks like. The second student will not look at the picture in the textbook, so their textbook is closed. They will listen and draw based on what student number one explains. So after, then the students will compare how closely they drew the picture to the original being described. So for example, perhaps I'm trying to explain this picture here. 
I might say, uh, explain it with my words and say, this is a drawing of a ocean. And on the right side, there's a palm tree. So maybe the, the student number two who's listening is like, okay, hmm, ocean, oceans are blue. Okay, I'm gonna draw an ocean and palm tree. Okay, so I'll do, I don't remember what a palm tree looks like. So I'm just gonna do this, <laughs> okay. And then they, uh, maybe student one will then explain Okay, there's a person, a boy. Okay, so now I'm gonna draw a boy here. Ooh. <laughs> okay, so student one is explaining. Student two is drawing the picture without looking. Afterwards, they look at the two pictures and say, how close are these? Okay, so you missed some of the people in the background or he's not a boy, he's actually a man, right? He's older. Um, so you can see and compare uh, the pictures. So you can have students do that if there are any pictures in the book. It gets students to look at the pictures in an interesting way and also use English to describe the pictures. So let's look and see, does it engage students' interests? Maybe, maybe they really enjoy drawing. So that might be something that is uh, something they like, like to do. Does it encourage student interaction? Yes, one student must explain and the other must listen in order to draw the picture. Does it relate to the real world? I said maybe, probably not really related to the real world. Does it lead to creative speaking or writing? Absolutely. The student who is explaining must think of how do I describe this picture? Right? And does it focus on meaning? Yes, it does focus on meaning because there is purposeful communication happening here. Okay, now we have our last activity, which is the role plays. So this can be something where students are in small groups and they share about different people or the skills they think others are good at. Students must create a sentence and mark the space. So for example, my sister is good at science. So then we have team O here. They're trying to get tic-tac-toe three in a row. Um, Another name for this is knots and crosses, uh, but in America we say tic-tac-toe and you're trying to get three in a row. So you could create this on the board or you can have uh, printouts for groups of students to play around and they must go ahead and share. So they have to create sentences based off of the different pictures that are in each of the boxes. So does this engage students' interest? Uh, yes, because it might relate to the actual things that people are good at, right? Does it encourage student interaction? Yes, does it relate to the real world? Mm, maybe, may not. If you're actually talking about a real person, yes. Uh, but if it's just to try and get, get a certain space, maybe no, right? Does it lead to uh, creative speaking or writing? I think somewhat. And does it focus on meaning? Uh, maybe somewhat, so it depends. So as you notice, not all of these activities are created equally. So we might choose different kinds of activities uh, to adapt the textbook. Now here, I just wanted to share the references for uh, today's webinar. And finally, I wanted to say thank you so much, all of you, for your time um, and for coming here to listen. Um, please go ahead and share your feedback for this webinar so we can better serve you and your needs. Um, there's a QR code, and I have also shared in the chat box uh, the link to the feedback form for today's session. 
Finally, I wanted to just mention a few of the events uh, for those of you that were not here at the beginning that I mentioned. Uh, we will be having the Let's Speak English tomorrow night. It is happening. So please join us to have fun talking about Halloween, Halloween costumes and US culture. And we'll also be doing another webinar series on a couple of different topics, all really based on communicative language teaching topics. Um, so please join us at that event as well. So thank you again. We appreciate your time and we hope that you can join us for a future event. Thank you, everyone.